Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Aurélien Aptel, and I've been working on uh, making Emacs uh, extendable in C and other languages. So I was afraid this talk wouldn't be accepted at first because <laughs> the dev room is mostly Java stuff, so right. it's kind of far away from Emacs. You can call them Java and Emacs. <laughs> That's fine. Uh, I wouldn't agree with this. Uh, <laughs> no offense. Uh. <laughs> so uh, GNU Emacs, um, you might have heard of uh, it. I'm guessing if you're in this room, you already know a bit about it. So I'll, I'll go quick over this. So it's an editor of the Emacs family. It has been written in uh, 1976. So it's technically 32 years old, which is a pretty cool uh, age, I guess. Uh, it's still uh, popular, although it's certainly l uh, less popular than it was, I guess, 20, 20 years ago or something. So it's extensible. Uh, it's one of the first editors to be extensible in a, a proper language. Again, no offense. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> these are just jokes. Don't take this too seriously. Um, and it's self-documented. Uh, it was one of the first as well, which means uh, every time you extend something, you can put a doc string uh, similar to Python, if you're familiar with this, and you can access the documentation from within Emacs, and everything is, uh, you can do everything from Emacs, documented, extensive, uh, yeah, expanded. So it's, uh, Emacs is also intertwined with the hacker culture. So um, Lisp was extremely popular in the MIT AI lab, and so you had, uh, they even developed these machines there where the processor would actually have instructions to uh, deal with uh, consoles and, and such. So it's a fascinating stuff. I've put a couple of links here you, you can explore if you want to dig into it. Um, did you know uh, Stallman had a published ACM uh, article about Emacs? I didn't, so that's interesting. Um, there's uh, Jamie Zawinski who made uh, made the timeline about the different families of Emacs uh, that's out there. Uh, recently, the Stefan Monnier, the current maintainer of Emacs, uh, wrote a, like uh, an article about how the language evolved and on how it got all the hits f uh, features uh, and such. So, uh, plenty of material to uh, go through. So, back to the editor. So, uh, Emacs is extensible in uh, Emacs Lisp. Uh, it's it's a nice uh, sort of nice language, although many people familiar with Lisp w would say it's so very well designed. It kind of grew organically, and uh, compared to other Lisps, it's maybe not the most uh, <coughs> practical to use. Uh, so Emacs has a bytecode compiler within Emacs, uh, written in Emacs Lisp, and it has a VM. So basically, Emacs is. Uh, an interpreter for Lisp, which also you know features uh, editing commands and, and such. So it's still new, uh, not very fast. Um, some people have tried to make it fast, uh, uh, yeah, faster by uh, so they made the bytecode compiler. Uh, at the moment, there's an experimental JIT branch. JIT kit. I, uh, uh, I haven't <coughs> I haven't tried it um, yet, but it looks promising. Uh, I've heard it, it could speed up by like twice some use case. Uh, I, I know also Tom Tromey, with, who might be in this room. I, I don't know if you're here. Uh, oh, hi. Um, has worked on the eLisp compiler that would target uh, LLVM. So the compiler itself is written in Emacs Lisp, which is an interesting choice, I, I guess. He also, he also worked on the Emacs FFI, which I'll talk about later. <coughs> so if you want to extend Emacs, uh, there's a couple of uh, ways to interact with the rest of your system. So uh, initially you add files. It's a text editor, so files are a common way to uh, exchange data fr from one program to the other. Uh, eventually it got processes, so you can start and interact with process uh, interactively. So the way it works in Emacs is um, you associate a, a process in a buffer, and so every time this process would write stuff, it, it gets appended to the buffer, and you can uh, set up callbacks to process the output. Uh, they're called inferior processes in uh, Emacs jargon. 
Uh, you also got uh, TCP and UDP sockets, so you can technically make a full server and client within Inimax. Uh, I know a guy on the uh, mailing list, uh, Nick Ferrier, I think. He made a full web uh, server in uh, Emacs. He has a whole web page about it. It's interesting, again. Uh, uh, so we also have Dbus, uh, but I don't know much about this, so I cannot really go in there. So all of those uh, methods are not always convenient because at some point you always need to serialize your uh, data structure from Lisp to whatever uh, program you want to communicate with. And you, you have to do it in both directions. So um, most common solutions to, to do this inter-process uh, communication is uh, either you write your whole program in pure Emacs, Emacs Lisp, which means uh, yeah, no, basically no inter-process communication, just everything in Emacs. Uh, alternatively, you write a separate program, and then you call it from Emacs. So you can do the heavy lifting in your external program and then interact with it uh, from Emacs. And there's, a, there's also another way that to do things some some extensions they have they read, so they have a separate program but it's a server and so you can keep uh, a state between calls from Emacs uh, by keeping it in the server. Um, so uh, the uh, next way to go about it is to have a native API to uh, interact with uh, the system uh, at the most uh, lowest level, so a C API. So this is not uh, new. Uh, some people have tried to do this for a while. Steve Kemp in 2000 uh, allowed uh, to have uh, C defense. So defense is the way in Emacs uh, core when you implement a new function in C. There's a macro called defense and uh, it defines uh, some stuff for you and it'll, it ends up make, making a new Emacs Lisp function. So you, uh, he made a, a patch that would allow for uh, to load dynamically uh, C defense like th this way. But it was never merged for uh, various reasons. Uh, one of them I'll go later in, into. Um, on Reddit, someone told me, actually the, the actual Rainy Urban, I didn't know this guy, but uh, he told me uh, shortly after this, he made another improvement on it and tried to uh, send it, but never got merged either. But in, uh, it ended up in uh, X Emacs, which is a fork of Emacs, which some of you might remember from back in the day. Uh, in 2006, uh, Dave Love tried again, same idea, but this time he used the lib tool for the dynamic loading. This is a, a GNU tool uh, uh, and set of uh, libraries that, would, that makes it easy to dynamically load uh, uh, <coughs> the equivalent of DLLs or shared objects on, on Linux. So this, this API works on every platform, so this was uh, more portable than the other attempts. But again, never merged. Uh, so why is this never merged? Well, mostly is because um, uh, the people uh, maintaining Emacs, which were mostly uh, Richard Tolman at the time, were afraid that people would ship uh, free Emacs uh, along with uh, already built uh, shared libraries, which could potentially not be free. So he was afraid people would make bundles of uh, Emacs with uh, non-free software. So he's pretty um, anal about this, as you might know. Uh, but uh, this, uh, this problem has been existing for a while in other projects. Um, GCC, for, long di for the longest time, also had uh, issues with this. They wanted plugins, dynamic plugins, but they never reached any uh, traction because of this uh, GPL problem. But sometime in 2009, uh, they uh, settled on a, on, a on a compromise. And uh, this compromise is the plugin has to have this uh, symbol which says, the name of the symbol is literally plugin is GPL compatible. So you might ask, uh, how is this uh, enough to enforce uh, like, uh, laws and stuff like this? I'm, I'm not a lawyer, so uh, I cannot really explain the details, but... Um, so the GNU sta coding standard has this uh, quote. Uh, so by, by adding this check to your program, you are not creating a new legal requirement. The GPL itself requires plugins to be free software, uh, licensed compatibly. The GPL and AGPL already requires those plugins to be released under a compatible license. Blah, blah, blah. Uh, the symbol definition in the plugin 
makes it harder for anyone who might distribute proprietary plugins to legally defend themselves. If a case against, uh, if a case about this got to court, we can point to that symbol as evidence that the plugin developer understood that, that the license had this requirement. So yeah, it doesn't really enforce anything, but it's uh, enough to sue, I guess. So that was the workaround. <coughs> so in 2014, I started my own attempt. I learned about this uh, workaround uh, pretty late. Uh, I thought it would be a good way to extend uh, Emacs even more. So I made it uh, libtool based again. It was linking against the Emacs binary. Uh, which is not something you always want, apparently. Uh, I'll go on that later. Um, so it was kind of the same as before. It allowed you to write CD funds outside of Emacs and load them dynamically. I sent it on a mailing list and it was received positively, but people wanted more. Uh, there was some iterations on it. Um, so most people don't like when their editor crashes. Surprising uh, thing, right? Uh, so people wanted something more robust because um, the way it was done, basically you had to know the, um, uh, the internal data structures of Emacs to interact with it. And so after an update, if you load the same dynamic plugin which was written for the previous version of Emacs, some fields might have been added to structures and such in a way that would just make Emacs crash. And this is really not something you want for a text editor. So the next situation um, is uh, based, it's very similar in the, des in the design to the GNI, which Java people might uh, know. Uh, it's the Java native interface. It's basically what Java uses to do the same thing. So this was, uh, I had a lot of help on this. Uh, people from uh, big companies actually. So Daniel Colacion, at, at least at the time, is work was working at Facebook. And Philippe Stefani is at Google. So yeah, a lot of Emacs users still out, the, out there. <coughs> so we implemented this, and it's the design is a lot different, uh, as you see. So after uh, more iterations, uh, it was finally merged in Emacs 25, and uh, it was basically two years of on and off work, not full time. A lot of reviews and uh, bike shading on the mailing list, as is always the case with Emacs. People complaining about small stuff, and you have to redo things. So uh, how does it work? So first of all, you have to build your Emacs with, uh, you have, when you configure, you have to pass this flag. It's not enabled by default yet, still. Uh, you need to pass uh, dash dash with module when you run configure. So uh, how does it work? Um, so in this version, you don't link against the Emacs binary. You, um, there's a header file you just need to include. And um, it defines a set of structures and uh, function pointers by which uh, you interact with the Emacs Lisp VM in a like, proper uh, API. So it doesn't break after re uh, Emacs releases. So uh, all the function, the C function you want to expose have to have this prototype. So you have... You have the uh, Emacs environment structure, which I'll uh, go in detail after afterwards. The number of arguments, uh, an array of uh, Emacs Lisp uh, values, and some um, user-provided uh, pointer you can choose. And uh, so the environment provides you with uh, function pointers to interact with the VM. So this one would convert a C int into an Emacs Lisp uh, value of ints. So the function returns an Emacs value, which is an opaque type. I'll go on that later. So this is basically uh, what a Emacs Lisp C function looks like. So in order to make this um, function callable, callable from Lisp, you um, you use the environment pointer. There's a function uh, pointer in there called uh, make function. You pass it the number of arguments, uh, the minimum number of arguments, the maximum. This is the, fun the um, a pointer to the function you defined earlier, the C stuff, uh, doc string here, and uh, this is the void uh, star, which was the last parameter uh, of the function. Uh, here, okay, well, the void here. 
Um, so ELISP is a LISP2, which means every symbol has uh, two cells. So it's like having two namespaces for variables and functions. So when you do a defund in ELISP, where you say the function foo is uh, defined to this code, what, I, what it actually does in the background is setting the function cell of the symbol foo to this uh, lambda. So that's basically what you have to do uh, using the API. So uh, fun call is the function pointer to make a function call in the ELISP VM. Uh, you have to pass a symbol to, to, to the fset call. Uh, this is done via the intern function, which converts a string to a symbol. So you pass, yeah, you call fset. There's two arguments. Uh, uh, the first one is uh, the name of the function uh, you, you want to bind to. And the second one is the actual lambda you want to bind to. So this is exactly, uh, uh, yeah, fset, foo, lambda here. Uh, OK. So uh, if you put it all together, this is basically what your plugin would look like. You have the uh, plugin, the mandatory symbol to say your plugin is GPL compatible. Uh, you call your make function. You pass all the arguments. And you bind it to the name you want. So in this case, this function will be callable through the name mymod-test uh, in Lisp. And uh, that's it. Um, so you would uh, compile, oh wait, I, I forgot to mention something. Uh, Emacs module init is uh, the function that um, Emacs will call when it loads your plugin. So everything that needs to be initialized is done through here. It's the entry point of your module, basically. So to compile, it's pretty standard if you're familiar with the shared libraries on Linux. So this ex actually works as uh, on Windows as well. You just need to call the equivalent, but it should work as well. So uh, first step is you turn your C into a uh, object code. You want to pass this uh, position independent flag so that it works uh, no matter where it's loaded in the Emacs binary. Then you turn it into a shared object. Uh, this is on uh, this way. It's just magic incantation. Um, so how, uh, within the API, how does memory management works? So every time uh, a C Lisp function is called, all the stuff you allocate in it is automatically freed when the function returns. So you don't really have to worry about uh, memory management within the function. Uh, you can uh, mark uh, values as uh, global. They're reference counted. Uh, so if you need to use the same values in two different function calls, uh, you can do so by making them global. So in, in this example, I turned the symbol uh, t, which is true in Emacs Lisp. I store it in this global variable here. And in this other function, I can just reuse it without having to intern it again. So it just saves a couple of calls this way. Um, so yeah, unless you need the global references, you don't need to worry about man memory management. Um, you can only use the um, Emacs values you allocated within Emacs uh, C Lisp functions. Like you cannot have a, a thread that would access those values outside of uh, when you called them from Emacs. That's one of the limitations. Um, yeah, so usually you would do this to, yeah, to cache values because you don't want to recompute them every time you run a function. So error handling. Um, Emacs Lisp has um, a signal, but C doesn't. So somehow you have to convert. So signals work kind of like exceptions in other languages. And so somehow C doesn't have them, and you have to convert yeah, those two different uh, mindsets of uh, dealing with it. Um, so the way we implemented it in Emacs is um, if a function gets signaled when you call it, uh, in the environment pointer, there's a flag that says you, you can check for it every time you call a function that says uh, whether or not it exited uh, via signal or, or, or if it returned normally or if it uh, used the throw thing. 
you might have a signal in throw. <coughs> so it's similar to uh, error no in uh, C. It's uh, every time there's an error uh, in uh, libc uh, f function calls, the, lib the libc fun function would set error no to a certain value, and you have to check it afterwards. So yeah, similar. Uh, you can clear the flag by calling uh, non-local exit clear. Um, yeah, so there's two ways to go about it. Either you check every single API call, or you only check after important ones because um, the API, every time you do a call, it checks if there's already the flag set, and if it is, it just doesn't do anything and fails automatically. So you don't have to actually check every call if you know what you're doing. But it's very verbose to check all the time, so that's an issue. But that's how it is if you want to go from exceptions to uh, regular error codes. So I also had to add um, a new Emacs Lisp object type, so you can wrap any kind of pointers. So uh, those functions in the API would uh, allow you to, if you, if you use a library that uh, makes uh, uh, provides a handle of when you open a resource, you can store that handle inside a, a user pointer this way. So you have a function to make it, uh, to get and set it. And uh, they have fi uh, there's a finalizer to it, so that when the object is garbage collected, <laughs> You can set a function that will be called when it when it does, so you don't have leaks this way, memory leaks. So uh, I have a demo for you. I have a really simple uh, module. Can everybody read fine? Yeah. So um, in this in this directory, I have uh, Emacs uh, configured with um, with modules. Uh, you have to trust me on this. I won't compile it again. Uh, <laughs> it's kind of long, so. And uh, in this folder, I have my mod.c. So this is the header that ha has all the um, API defined. Uh, you have the monetary symbol. You have the C function here, which you, we want to expose to Emacs. It just returns 42. Uh, this is the bind thing I showed earlier. So it sets the function cell of the symbol. Uh, so you want to set, you have a function, you want to be able to call it by the name uh, foo. You would pass foo here. Uh, and here you would pass the lambda, uh, the function that you want to call. So um, yeah, you enter an f set, you enter the name of the function, and then you just make the call by doing a fun call. So usually, um, Emacs packages, they have this um, way to say uh, they're already loaded. And so you, you call provide at the end of your uh, list package, usually. So here, I just do the same thing. This is equivalent to calling provide, and then the symbol uh, passed uh, as argument. So yeah, this is basically what I showed earlier. Um, you make a lambda you, that has uh, zero ag arguments. You make it called this C function. You pass it this doc string. And the arbitrary uh, pointer, I just pass null because I don't really use it this time. I call bind function to make this function callable by this name. And then I say, this module is loaded under the name uh, my mod, basically. And then I return zero. And this function gets called the moment I load it in, uh, in Emacs. So I just uh, compiled the module. You can see the comments being run here. Uh. 
So in order to be able to load the module I just built, I have to add it to, um, to the path, which is search through for modules. It's called load path. Now I just require it. So this is the symbol uh, when I put provide. This is the symbol I used, and so this is what I would require. So it has been successfully loaded. Now I can call my test, and it just returned 42. <laughs> There's a couple of other slides. Uh, don't, don't leave yet. Uh, oh. So um, the, the title of the talk was you can also extend it uh, using other languages. So as long as your language can. Ah. Uh, Emacs can load any valid modules, so any shared object which follows the API uh, we, we saw can be loaded. So if your language can compile to a shared object and manipulate pointers in one way or another, then it's probably usable. So people have, have been writing like, shim layers to, um, to, co to uh, be able to uh, uh, write modules in other languages. So I know there's one in Rust, uh, OCaml, Go, Nim, and probably others. Uh, so I haven't tried them, but they're there. So feel free to try them out. Um, there's an uh, extensive documentation written by Philip Stephanie. There's a link there you can check. It covers many cases, uh, corner cases, and uh, questions you might have as well. Uh, Chris Wellen has a blog where he also experimented with it. He made a simple C module, and uh, he also has a post about how he managed to use signals, Unix signals, so that um, he, he, made, he made a module with a thread that does certain things, polling and other things. And the, every time uh, this module wants to signal, uh, signal back to the Emacs process, it sends, a, it sends a unique signal. And it's a nice way to have async requests this way. Otherwise, with the pure API, you, you can only call your module from Emacs. There's no way to um, independently make uh, your module call back to Emacs. Uh, there's uh, another guy who uh, made plenty of modules. He never talked to me, but he made a, a lot of stuff on GitHub. Uh, and I'll go very quick. Uh, so there's already a bunch of existing modules, mostly uh, library bindings. So there's one for SQL leads, uh, CSound, OpenSSL, uh, JSON parsers, and other things. Some people have even embedded interpreters of other languages in a module. So you can run Python in Emacs. Uh, yeah, there's, or Ruby or Lua, whatever. Um, so the next step would be to write a foreign function interface, which would allow. So at the moment, you have to write C or something else as an intermediary layer to actually access your library. So another way to go about it would be to fully stay in the Max Lisp and load any library, not specifically a module. And so uh, Tom Tromi has done some work. He made a a mod, uh, it's actually a module that um, allows you to write Lisp to just uh, load any library. And he hasn't implemented the GPL check, so it will probably never get merged. Um, so yeah, that's it. Thank you.